My name is Lisa Hayward and I'd like to welcome you to Callers Chat, an online space that I've created for callers to come together and chat about all things calling. Today I'm delighted to welcome Louise Siddons to our stage. Louise is a dance caller and teacher who covers lots of different social folk dance styles including Contra, Kaylee and the Living Playford tradition. Um, today Louise is going to share her insight on a topic that I think is just so central to being a caller, which is reading the room and adapting your calling to the dancers. So I'm really excited to hear what Louise has got to say and without further ado I'll hand over to Louise. Thank you, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Louise Siddons and I am a caller based in Winchester. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the kinds of things that I call but I'll just say for the beginning that I started calling in 2008 I started with English country dancing and then uh, expanded into various things and um, yeah, moved to Winchester just over a year ago, uh, spent a very long time in the States, which you can hear in my accent, but um, was born in London. Okay, so reading the room is my topic and I chose that in part because when Lisa and I started talking about what I might talk about uh she said, do you want to talk about how you started calling Kaylee and what it was like to switch to Kaylee from Contra and English country and other things that you do? And I said, well, it's sort of the, the line is not that straight. Um, so uh, maybe I'll talk just about how I find differences between the different kinds of gigs that I call. And um, that ended up being um, this topic of reading the room. How do you figure out what kind of gig you're at? Um, because even though it says something on the tin, it might not be that when you get there. Um, so I do literally everything from the most complicated kind of, uh, living play for tradition, English country dance type workshops. I've called it Sidmouth. I've called in the States. I've called, um, all over, uh, the UK at this point doing English country dancing, I do a lot of club calling, so folk dance clubs where they do a mixture of everything, English and Playford, Contra, Squares, some international <clears throat> um, folk dance type stuff, some Scottish, some uh, some of whatever you bring as a caller, really. Um, I call straightforward Contra dances, um, like London Barn Dance, uh, like um, the Contra series in Bristol, Edinburgh, um, Leeds, Ulster, where else? Uh, and of course, again, um, I uh, spent a long time in the States and called all over the place there too. Um, and then I call barn dances and Kayleys. So um, when I started calling, uh, the, the year after I started calling, I moved across the United States from Michigan to Oklahoma. Um, that's a north-south across for those of you who like geography. Um, and what happened there was that basically I went from having really kind of... Um, very pure Contra and English country dance gigs to doing a lot of things like weddings and birthday parties and group events. And so um, I would call those barn dances. I think even in the UK, they would have been called barn dances for a very long time. But then when I moved back here in 2021, um, I had been moving back and forth, uh, but really only calling um, English and Contra. And when I moved here permanently again, I um, got invited to call Kaylee's in Brighton where I was living. And so I started calling Kaylee more consistently again for the first time, probably in about a decade. Um, and I will talk about why I stopped in the U.S. Um, in the course of this conversation um, and uh, and also why I started again once I got to Brighton. Um, spoiler alert, it's because of the gender thing. <laughs> um which will come up uh, quite a lot. So then I also teach couple dances. I teach swing, I teach waltz um, and various things like that. Uh, and I like to think that what I'm known for as a caller uh, includes the fact that I teach very clearly, um, that I have a reasonable sense of humor. Um, but I think to be honest, most of it beyond the things that just happened kind of organically uh, because I was local to places, um, has been because of the the gender free calling that I uh, started very publicly advocating for um, in about 2017. Um, so, what are my goals as a caller? I think um, when you're thinking about what uh, what is this room full of dancers wanting from me, 
the first thing you have to answer is what, what do you want to give them? Right. What are your goals? So my fundamental goal is to meet the needs of the dancers in front of me. Um, and I think those needs very significantly. And we're going to talk about that, or I'm going to talk at you about that. And then hopefully we'll discuss, um, but if you meet the needs of the dancers, it means they've had fun. So really my goal is to let people have fun. Um, and according to their definition of fun, not a pre, uh, conceived notion of fun that I'm bringing into the room. Um, also my goal as a caller is to have fun myself. Uh, I think that often we can forget that we're allowed to have fun, um, in any kind of work. And, uh, to me, it's um, it's probably my top priority in every kind of work that I do is to to have fun myself as well as making sure the people around me are having fun, um, and that can mean setting some clear goals for them as well as for myself. Um. So then, what do I mean by reading the room? Um, fundamentally, I think most straightforwardly, what I mean is that how and what we call depends on where we are and who's in front of us. And that can be super literal, right? Um, it can be, what is this room? Um, how big is it? Is it going to be crowded or is it going to have a lot of space? Um, what shape is it? Can we do circle dances easily or are we really better off with long ways dances? Um, what are the acoustics like? Are there parts of the room where no one can hear a word I'm saying, um, no matter what we do uh, as sound engineers? And is there a stage? Uh, in some situations, I can easily see the whole room of dancers. And in other situations, I can see the front row uh, sort of thing. Um, and that matters in terms of what I choose to teach uh, or call. Um, less literally, uh, you have to read the dancers as a caller. And so the first thing that I'm asking myself is what do the dancers want and how do I know what they want? And so part of reading the room for me is that you get some information ahead of time and then you get a lot of information in the moment. And you are, as a caller, constantly kind of balancing those two things. Um, so sometimes I know ahead uh, a little bit what to expect because I've danced in a place before. Um, I was dancing at London Barn Dance, for example, for about a decade before I ever called there, maybe longer. Um, if it's a folk dance club where I'm a dancer as well as a caller, then I know very well who's going to be there, what they're expecting, what the repertoire is. I have a lot of information, but I do a lot of gigs, uh, especially when it's Kaylee. I should say the only um, the only regular Kaylee series that I call are our own here in Winchester, um, which I run with my partner, and then uh, the Rant Kaylee in Brighton, which is where I started calling Kayleys again here in the UK. Um, but all the other Kayleys that I do are one-offs. Um, and so I'm walking into a completely unfamiliar situation. And um, and then also folk dance clubs, if I travel or contra dances that are far away, I might never have danced there before. Um, and so organizers tell me things, right? Or the people who hire you, um, the, the wedding couple might ask for specific things. I had a couple say, well, we went to a Kaylee and we did Jenny pluck pears and we really want to do that at our wedding. And I was like, oh, that's not likely. Um, but what can I do that's like that? Because A, I sort of knew um, that they wouldn't remember. Um, they gave me a very long list of dances. Uh, and I thought, well, they'll remember the vague shapes and things, but they're not Kaylee dancers. They won't, they won't know if I did a slightly different thing than the thing they asked for. Um, they just wanted to ask for that kind of style. And I can do that. Um, but also you get organizers who say, oh, you know, like we have a good group. Um, they're small, but they're really um, experienced. And then you show up and either you luck out and it's the night that 10 new people showed up or um, it's they're all really experienced, but only five of them came. And so you're doing things you don't necessarily expect and you have to kind of work on the fly. Um, so how do you sort of uh, above and beyond the information you think you've had ahead of time, how do you then get to the room and think about that? Um, and so there are a lot of different things that I think about, but the first thing I do is I kind of scan the room. Um, and I would say this applies to any kind of uh, social dance that I'm calling. I just look around and I see, are there obvious physical constraints that we're gonna run into? Um, are there tiny children who are gonna wanna dance with adults? 
um, because maybe the arching dance is not the best choice there. Um, maybe it is, you know, read the room. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, are there um, are there people who are very elderly um, who are maybe going to move at a different speed or in a different way than people who are younger? Um, are there people who've been drinking a lot of alcohol? Um, I have definitely called the wedding and probably some of you have too, where um, people can barely stand up, let alone dance or, or hold hands reliably. Um, and so what do you do there to, to keep people safe and to keep people having fun? Um, I also try to check in with organizers, uh, for sort of invisible physical constraints that might exist. Um, organizers will know better than I can. Um, if there are people who tend to get very dizzy, if there are people who have sensory issues, if there are people who have other needs. And if you guys were at Catherine's caller chat last time, um, she raised a lot of those issues in a really uh, useful and kind of sympathetic way. Um, and uh, yeah, that was uh, a really important thing to remember. Um, so as you're looking at the room and you're asking, who are these dancers? I think also I try to think about why they hired me and what that says about who they think they are uh, or maybe who they want to be. Um, because I get hired quite a lot because I bring a certain audience with me. Um, I get hired because people think that I bring younger people with them uh, or with me, sorry, um, because I bring people who are interested in history or in complexity to the room. So I do get hired specifically to do kind of the advanced or complicated uh, sessions of things. Uh, they hire me because I'm an American um, and they think people will come. I remember one of the very first festivals I did after I moved back here permanently, um, the organizer wrote, you know, the American caller so-and-so. And I was like, well, I mean, sort of, but I'm actually British. <laughs> um, so awkward. And she's like, please don't tell anyone that. Like they'll come because you're an American. <laughs> and it was okay. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that's what I sound like. Uh, and it's half of what I am. So uh, yeah, I sometimes get hired because um, I identify as queer, uh, lesbian, however you want to phrase that. And that brings in a certain audience. Um, and so, um, yeah, other times I'm just one of, I mean, I think probably always I'm one of multiple callers who could do the job that needs being done. But um, sometimes I'm literally just the caller who is available. And so then um, that's also part of it, right, is... I try um, not to second guess why people have me in the room. Um, but if, uh, yeah, if that matters, then it also helps me promote events for um, for organizers. If I know why they hired me, um, I can intentionally try to reach out to those, uh, those demographics, if that's what it is, or um, those people. So um, what all of that means to me is that as a caller, when I'm in the room, I'm adjusting my persona uh, to accommodate those expectations and to think about what people want. So if I get hired because they want someone who knows a lot about the 18th century, um, then I'm like, okay, I'm here because I have a historian hat that I can put on and I will put that on and I will tell some of that history. Um, if they're hiring me because they want someone who's going to know all of the little twiddly details of a choreography and they want someone who's going to be picky about technique, then I have to put that hat on. But those two hats are wildly inappropriate at most Kayleys that I call, right? Like no one wants me to be like, and did you know that this tune was written? And no. Um, so sometimes uh, people want me to be... Um, just an entertainer uh, or even a comedian, right? There's a kind of um, stage presence that is very different if you are trying to encourage people who are maybe shy or reluctant to get on the floor. Sometimes my job as a caller is to be a social catalyst to get people dancing together who don't know each other, right? At a wedding, you can often have two awkward sides of the room um, and you have to get them in one dance space and uh, interacting. Um, sometimes you're a community builder. Sometimes you're a carer, you know, like I did a gig a, a little while ago. Um, and one of the organizers said to me, you know, the goal here really is to, um, to keep people in community with one another, not to dance. Um, 
And so how do I think about that as I'm a caller? What uh, what kinds of things am I going to do there to make that uh, the experience that they have, as well as the intent of the organizers? Um, part of reading the room is not just reading the dancers and the space, but also reading the band. Um, what can they do well? Uh, I have a lot of experiences of working with bands that I've never worked with before. I think probably all callers have that, maybe um, slightly less so in the Kaylee world, where it tends to be that a caller works with a band over and over again. Um, so like the rank Kayleys, uh, it's always a, a subset of the same musicians, right? We know each other really well at this point. Um, but with Contra or with English, um, I'm often working with people who, if I'm lucky, I've worked with maybe a couple of times before. Um, and so I try to do my homework. I think, uh, like I said, about kind of space and dancers, you can you can get some information ahead of time by showing up. You can listen in the case of bands to CDs. Uh, you can watch videos online. I think that's sometimes more useful because a CD is kind of a separate thing than a playing for a dance. Um, but but from a CD, you can get a sense of repertoire of um, kind of instrumentation, which is also uh, important. Um, but for me, one of the most important things that you can't tell until you show up is how well does a band work with the caller? Um, and that sounds like a, um, a value judgment or a kind of judgment of, of skill. But what I mean is not so much how well do they work with any caller, but how well do they work with me? Because I come into the room with a certain style and certain expectations. And every time you work with a new band, you're reminded that those aren't necessarily shared. <laughs> um, and so uh, things like you talk to the band and you say, you know, um, what, what kind of language works for you about what tunes I need, right? Like a lot of Kaylee bands are like, if you don't have a set tune, just tell us jigs or reels or, uh, you know, slip jig or whatever. Um, they don't want to know uh, a lot of information necessarily. And that's true of a lot of bands, right? Um, whether they're playing for Contra or what have you, everyone's going to be different. But also one of the things that I've learned to really appreciate in a Kaylee context, especially, um, but also if I'm calling squares, is the band that seems psychic because they're paying so much attention to you and to the dancers. Um, and it's like, oh yeah, this dance is, you know, 32 bars, but the way that the people in front of me are dancing it, it's 47. Um, and so we're just going to accommodate that. Um, and a band that can see that the dancers are off and that I, as a caller, am aware and I'm adjusting to them in order to get them not necessarily back to the tune, but hopefully back to the phrase. Um, they can work with me to do that. That's magic. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes you get really lucky and you have musicians who can do that, but other times you have musicians who, uh, for whatever reason are like, mm, it's your job as a caller to get people dancing correctly. We can do an extra A if you want, but we're not going to kind of fill in seven bars or 13 or some strange number. Um, like that's just beyond, uh, I think, a reasonable expectation, to be honest, for any band. And so it is just luck if you get someone who's willing to do it. Um, but then, uh, yeah, you just you sort of learn, um, you learn how to work together and you have other strategies like, OK, well, how do I communicate to you that we're going to go out now? Kind of regardless of where we are, what's your best uh, kind of what's your uh, most effective way of doing that? Um, all of that communication stuff. Some of it you can do ahead and some of it you're learning as you go. Um, and uh, yeah, I think if you as a caller can work with the band to get the best out of them, then everyone has a better time. Um, and that's really important. Um, so I think uh, ultimately for me, reading the room accurately doesn't just mean that everyone has fun. Um, it means that you're making a safe space uh, I think safety is a prerequisite for fun. If people aren't feeling safe in a space, they're not actually having fun um, in the way that you want them to as a caller. But I also feel quite strongly that that safety should be 
I used the word invisible in my notes and I don't mean invisible. I mean, incorporated in and consistently part of the message, right? Like that everything you do is talking about safety because safety is fun. Um, and also you're not necessarily talking explicitly about safety. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are lots of ways to make the room safe. Um, so I don't want to list all of them, but I did want to say that that safety is not just about the safety of the dancers. Uh, it's also about the safety of you as a caller. Um, and, and so I wanted to talk about gender free calling, which is usually what people ask me to talk about by talking about how it made me feel safer as a caller in the spaces I was calling in, because I think a lot of the conversations around gender free calling, um, are about being inclusive of dancers. Um, and very uh, infrequently, do you hear a caller saying, I'm doing this for me? And I think that's because it sort of uh, goes against our sort of unstated values of community and prioritizing the dancers and blah, blah, blah. Like we're not supposed to be like calling is about me, but if I'm not feeling safe and I'm not having fun, then I don't want to do it anymore. So uh, I said at the beginning that I stopped calling barn dances. I stopped calling particularly the one-off kinds of barn dances like weddings um, when I was living in Oklahoma. And that was partly because they were very unsafe spaces for me. Um, it was a wedding. It was a Christian gathering of the evangelical variety. And I suddenly realized like if people wouldn't want me in their social space as a human being, I don't wanna be in that social space as a caller. Um, and the homophobia in those spaces was very strong. Um, and I thought they, they, they're only, they're only hiring me because they don't know who I am. Um, and also because it's rural America, I was driving a long way to a lot of these gigs. Um, and so there's that moment of like, okay, this is a five hour drive. What happens if my car breaks down? What happens if I have to stop somewhere for gas and someone kind of decides that's a single woman, even if they don't read me as uh, as gay, they j might just read me as a target. And I thought there's so little safety in these situations. And, and then I have to show up and I have to pretend, you know, because as a caller, as particularly at events like that, you get asked to kind of advocate for the event that's happening. And I thought, I just, I can't do it. So I stopped. I just completely stopped calling any kind of gig like that. And then I got back to Brighton, uh, really. Um, I mean, it's not really back to Brighton. I'd never lived in Brighton before. Um, but people found out I was a caller and the rank Kaylee asked me if I would call. And the first dance that I went to, to kind of see, like, is this something I want to do? Um, Heather McAslin was calling and she was calling gender free and she was amazing. And I was like, oh, this is such an amazing space and Brighton's an amazing city and everyone is lovely. And like, yes, I want to do this again. I remember why it's fun um, because the gender had been taken out of it. And obviously, uh, or not obviously for those of you who don't live in the UK, maybe Brighton's an incredibly uh, queer friendly city and um, the Rank Cayley is just a lovely place to dance. Um, so I started doing it again, but I had switched to gender free calling myself many, many years earlier. Um, I started in 2017 in London. Um, and I say, like, when I tell this story and I'm on the record, I'm on YouTube telling this story, I'm sure more than once. Um, but when I tell the story, I say it's about dancers. You know, there were um, women who wanted to dance together and men who kept trying to split them up. Um, and so I switched to a positional style of gender free calling. So the men would dance together because they said, we don't want to be called ladies. And I said, fine, I won't call you anything. Um, I started calling positionally and, um, that made a big difference for me. Um, and then as I did more and more positional calling, I realized that it was making a difference for other people. It was allowing, uh, for intergenerationality, people who wanted gender free calling, could go to a dance and the people who didn't really, I'm not saying I say they didn't want it, who didn't care, um, but who were aggressively anti alternative role terms could still dance and enjoy it. And I do think for me, one of the most important things about social folk dancing is the intergenerationality of it. 
I don't like that that conversation has created a rift that people shorthand as an age-based rift. Um, there are people who are advocates on every side of this uh, conversation of every age. Um, but, but like I said, I don't really want to talk about them because for me, it really was about me. And I realized that the first time I danced to gender free calling, um, how radically it changed the way that I perceived my place in the community. Um, and then as a caller, I realized how much power I had, right? Because, um, it wasn't my choice. I ran a contra dance with students when I was at uh, Oklahoma State University. And the students came to me and said, we want to be gender free. Um, how should we do it? Because there weren't, you know, today the terms Larks and Robins are the alternative role terms of choice across the United States. Um, but that hadn't happened yet. It was earlier than that. Um, and so I said, well, we'll have to pick new terms. Um, so we did a dance where the first half I called ladies and gents and the second half, uh, they chose shoots and ladders, which is the American version of snakes and ladders. Um, and so the second half I called shoots and ladders and the same exact people, the same students were in the room for the first half and the second half. And in the first half, they were entirely hetero paired up. And in the second half, they all turned to each other and regardless of gender, we're like, do you want to be a shoot or a ladder? And I'm like, nothing happened. You guys, nothing has changed. Um, but for them, something had radically changed. Um, and I don't think it was that different from the 70 year old men in London who didn't want to be called ladies. Uh, I think it was that the language was telling them something about who they were supposed to feel like they were. And when the language changed, they had permission to be someone different um, or they had permission to not tie the dance to who they thought they were. Whatever it was, it was, um, it really drove home to me how my language as a caller directly impacts how people uh, feel that they have permission to behave. And although we shouldn't need permission to be any kind of way, we all want permission um, to be who we are. I think that's a fundamental part of being part of a community and a culture. Um, so yeah, I, I did it for me. Um, I still do it for me. I don't take gigs where they won't let me call the way I want to. Um, and, uh, Lisa said, can you please have a clear end to your talk? <laughs> and I did, I did Lisa, <laughs> but I have messed it up by starting to ramble. So, um, I'm just going to end that, uh, by saying the, ge the gender inclusivity, it was my priority because in a lot of other ways, I felt like when I found social folk dancing, I had found the most inclusive space I had ever encountered. Um, I'm an introvert. I'm on the spectrum. Uh, I was a really bad, like going out to the club dancer. And then I started folk dancing and it was like, no one cared that I read a book at the interval. No one cared that I didn't make eye contact, except if it was, you know, a shoulder round where you're supposed to, I'm like, I can do rules. I can't, I can't do, um, sort of extroverted social behavior in a way that a lot of spaces when I was especially a teen and in my twenties expected me to. So, so in a lot of ways, um, it was interesting to me to discover this space that I had really idealized as inclusive was alienating me on a fundamental level. And that as a caller, I had the power to change that. Um, so I'll end there. Mm -hmm.